It is good to sing and glorify the name of our God, to choose to praise him. It is a choice we can make. And we come together now and we choose to lift our voices in song and to declare his praises. As we do so, we're reminded of God's goodness and his grace and his favor uh, among us and with us. And that's something that God's people have done throughout the centuries when we gather together to worship. I once had a man come up to me and say, I, I like the, the service stuff, but wh why all the singing? Too much sing time. He said, it's not just sing time. We lift our voices and we declare who God is. And our hearts and minds are reminded of those truths. And so that's why we worship him and praise him. And we're glad you're with us to do that. Uh, starting on March 13th, we want to invite you to journey with us as a church family on something called 20 Days on Following Jesus. Now, of course, following Jesus uh, is not something you finish in 20 days. But it's a lifelong pursuit. But for 20 days as a church family, we're going to have video devotions that you can subscribe to. And members of our church staff will lead you through these about seven to ten minutes long to start your day focused on what does it mean to follow Christ? What are the practices? What are the disciplines? What are the things we should be thinking about as we're followers of Christ? Leading us up to the crucifixion and the resurrection. So we're going to follow him together right to the cross and the empty tomb. We encourage you to subscribe and take part in that beginning on March 13th to follow Jesus together as a church family. This afternoon, we have a big event we've been talking about for a number of weeks now called Good Design. Uh, four wonderful presenters talking to us about God's good design for human sexuality and gender. And many of you, over almost 800 of you, pre-registered for this event. Uh, some of you, if you did not pre-register and want to attend, we have room in an overflow room for you. You can attend in person. We are going to record it, make it available at a future date, so you can see the content there at some point in the future as well. Uh, just a little word to those of you moms and dads with little ones here. To this morning's message is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's biblical, but it is a little bit more mature-themed, and so you'll make your own decisions about who should stay or go uh, downstairs for that. But I am thrilled to introduce to you our speaker. I've heard her twice, and I'm excited to hear her for, for a third time. Her name is Rachel Gilson. Rachel works for Crew Ministries on the area of theological development and culture. She has a master's degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. She's written a wonderful book, which you all should order, called Born Again This Way. It's a fantastic read, uh, and I, I, I have heard her twice, as I said, and I know God is speaking through her to our church family, so I'm pleased to introduce to you, will you join me in welcoming Rachel Gilson. It almost, Jeff, it almost makes me wonder if you should just try to give it, since you've, since you've heard it twice. We get to the, no, okay. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here with you this morning to talk about such a vulnerable, important, weighty conversation as sexuality. And it's important for us to just name up front, this isn't some kind of topic that's just out there. This is a topic that impacts all of us personally. Um, it impacts the people that are in our lives. It's, it's deeply personal. And that's part of why this morning I'm going to start with sharing my own story because I want you to know where I'm coming from, uh, how I got to where I am today. And that, that's not so that my story can be weaponized or laminated on anybody else, but I do, think, I do think it's an important window. And one of the things that is important in terms of my own journey here is that, like probably some of you, I didn't actually grow up in a church-going household, um, not even Christmas or Easter. So my, my mother had been raised Catholic, but gave that up for cigarettes and boys as a 13-year-old. And my dad had been raised functionally nothing. So by the time they were doing their own household thing, raising me and my brother, it just wasn't a part of our fabric at all to go to church or even talk about spiritual things. As I got a little bit older, uh, end of middle school, into high school, I had a desperate longing to know, well, what is true, though? I, I wanted to know answers to the bigger questions. Now, I grew up in Southern California, which some of you might think of as more like Los Angeles, sort of big urban sprawl, but I actually grew up in a very rural place. Like my high school had a working farm and a place where you could tie up your horse if you took your horse to school. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, we had a lot of church going people around us in the community. And so I started asking more and more of my peers, like, hey, tell me more about this. I know you're a church goer, I, I wanna know more. But the answers I was getting from my peers just weren't particularly helpful for me. I, I wasn't yet exposed to the fact that Christianity is like the greatest intellectual tradition that's ever happened in the world. I was, I was getting more shallow answers or confusion. 
And my, the false thing I took from that was thinking, oh, Christianity must be a crutch for people who don't know how to think for themselves. This must be for stupid people or lazy people. And I started reading more in different traditions, and I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to be an atheist. That's, that's what makes sense of the world. You know, what we can see, what we can touch, that's all there is. And I developed a really hard edge, a real arrogance against Christians, on, even just on the intellectual front. But another thing that happened in high school that impacted my relationship to Christianity was that I realized the way that my female peers were feeling about other young men was actually how I felt about young women. It took a little while to discover this. Again, I didn't grow up going to church. I had really, my household was very lax. And so I was having romantic and sexual relationships with young men pretty early. And it always felt a little awkward. And you could be thinking your problem is that you were hooking up with teenage boys, and you're not wrong. But it just felt a little out of place. It's sort of like when you're uh, maybe try a beer for the first time, and this is kind of gross. Do you just need to get used to this as a, thing, a taste you need to develop? But then when I started having romantic and sexual relationships with other young women, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is a totally different thing. I, I think this is what other people are talking about when they talk about this meaningful connection. I felt so much more at home in these relationships with other young women as opposed to young men. And it was a different, this was in 2001 to 2003 when I, the later years of high school. A lot has changed in our culture in those, in those 20 years. You know, this was back when Will and Grace was still edgy and not just nostalgic. You know, it was back before any state had legalized same-sex marriage. But I had a sense as I lived into my sexuality that the future was with me. I realized I want to marry a woman someday and I do think that's gonna be possible and I'm gonna step forward into that. But the interesting thing to me as I look back now is I also understood that Christians would be opposed to me based on my sexuality, even though I had never been mistreated by a Christian or by like a church group because of my relationships with young women. I just picked up sort of from the culture, from the air, that Christians would be opposed to me. So not only did I think of Christians as idiots, but I also thought of Christians as bigots. So it's like a really unflattering portrait uh, to move through the world with. And so I was, um, I was tricked into moving to New England from Southern California to start my college career because uh, all the brochures that advertised what Yale was like had these beautiful October red trees and this soft lighting, and I thought, oh, New England, how magical and glorious, and it's not. It's disgusting most of the time, but I was excited <laughs> to move across the country to Connecticut and start my Yale career. I, I was excited to finally be in a place where I could explore big ideas, live into my sexuality a little bit more, and I had really built my life on these two pillars, you know, the first was my intellectual awesomeness, which is just laughable as a teenage girl, but there you go. Uh, and the other pillar that I was building my foundation on was the girl that I was dating at the time who I functionally worshiped. I thought these pillars are gonna be a great foundation to build upon. But God in his kindness, if I use a, an image from my rural ranching background, uh, it's like he got in his truck, took some chains, tied them around my pillars, tied those to his truck, and just pulled them out from underneath me. Um, so on the one hand, if you go to a very unimpressive, middle of nowhere public high school, um, you might not be the smartest person at the world-class university you go to. I showed up at Yale and found out, uh-oh, I'm not nearly as smart as I thought I was, nor nearly as smart as everyone else around me. So that first pillar just crumbled to dust. All four years, basically. And then the other pillar, the girl that I was dating, well, early into my freshman year, she broke up with me. So you already have to start with the point of teenage breakups are always emotional and difficult. But also who she left me for was just embarrassing. I mean, she, she left me for this guy who hadn't graduated high school and who lived in a van, but it wasn't even a nice van. Like, you had to, like, physically move it to get the engine to engage. I mean, it's just, it's just terribly embarrassing to be left for that guy. Um, and so I was really like sitting in my woundedness. And one of the things about, I don't know where this happens at other schools, but at Yale, you're not allowed to stay on campus during winter break. They make you go somewhere else 
because ostensibly they clean it. I mean, it never seemed any cleaner when you showed back up, but still, I couldn't, couldn't stay there. And so I'd actually already planned to spend winter break with my now ex-girlfriend, and I remember Christmas morning reading Don Quixote for homework on the futon. I could hear her with her new boyfriend in the other room, and I was just thinking, this is the worst Christmas ever. I'm just so, like, lonely and sad. And when I headed back to Yale, I was like, I don't, I don't even know who I am. Like, what do I do with myself? I was having an identity crisis, really. I remember thinking things like, oh, maybe I should write for the school newspaper. Except it turns out you had to be really smart to write for the school newspaper, and I, I didn't make that cut. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I'll just go to the gym more. That could be a fun thing to throw yourself into. And then I remembered that I'm really lazy, and so I just couldn't figure out where the heck I was supposed to go. And it never occurred to me oh, I should turn to Jesus because I didn't believe in Jesus. But really early back in that spring semester, again, it was never spring, that's just what they called it, we had a lecture on you know, the old dead French guy named Rene Descartes. You might know of him because he coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am. And actually from that phrase, the lecturer explained to us, uh, Descartes built this whole proof for the existence of God. And I remember sitting in the lecture thinking, that's kind of a stupid proof for the existence of God. And I'm still today not very impressed with Descartes' formulation. But I was really unnerved sitting in the lecture hall because I'd never heard that proof for the existence of God before. And I'd kind of prided myself on knowing several different proofs of the existence of God that I could just sort of shut down. I mean, I had made this one girl cry in high school just because she couldn't answer my objections. So I was unnerved that there was one that I didn't know. And if I'm honest, I was also sort of interested in the idea, which made me very uncomfortable. But I couldn't shake this sort of nascent interest. So like we all do when we need a question answered, I asked the internet. Um, that's, just, that's just what you do. So it was 2004, so your laptops were like this thick. You know, you couldn't actually carry them anywhere. You took all your upper body strength just to crank that top lid open. And I would sit there firing in religious search terms, um, seeing where I would end up, right? You know, sometimes you just follow these hyperlink trails. You start researching one thing, you know, like, oh, the history of Mexico. And then you end up through crazy links down, you know, like, oh, now I'm reading about potato farming somewhere else. You don't, you just follow these crazy paths. So I would type in all kinds of different things, but over and over again, I just kept coming back to reading about Jesus. I, I always ended up there. And the Jesus I was encountering in these readings was really different than the caricature of Jesus I had in my mind. Again, this was 2004, and I was a progressive, and Jesus, you know, he seemed in my mind sort of like an ancient George W. Bush wrapped in a toga, which was not an attractive image for me. <laughs> Very cartoonish and, and silly. But the Jesus I was reading about was different, definitely more textured, more tender. I particularly liked the stories um, where Jesus' opponents would come and try to like trap him in questions and he would just shut them down, which probably tells you more about me than anything else, that those are the ones I liked. As I was enjoying the character of Jesus more, I just felt growingly uncomfortable. Like this, I want to marry a woman someday. This doesn't work. These things are in competition. But the only two people I knew at Yale who identified as Christians were these two young women who were dating each other. And one of them was training to be a Lutheran minister. Um, and I met them in the marching band because I've never been cool. And so I remember thinking, oh, well, I should ask them, you know, she's going to be like a pastor. I should ask them what they think about us, how they reconcile this. And so I went to them. I was like, help me understand this because to me, these seem like so far apart. And they were really sweet, and they were like, oh no, it's all been a big misunderstanding. The Bible actually affirms monogamous gay relationships. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. And they gave me a packet uh, telling me this is gonna explain the correct way to interpret these scriptures. And I was pretty excited because I love a packet. So I took it back to my room, I was ripping through it, and it made a lot of sense. Like, it, it had an internal consistency, it was making good points. But I was also training to be a history major, and like one of the number one things as a history major is you have to read the original documents for themselves. So I thought, okay, well, I should actually read the Bible texts. I didn't have a Bible, but I had the internet, so I would 
pull up the different texts and, and compare them with what the packet was saying. And fairly quickly, it was like, oh, these things don't actually match. Like, these girls are super sweet and sincere, but it really doesn't seem to me like the Bible is actually saying yes to these relationships. And I felt sort of stupid for even thinking that that could have been a possibility. I felt stupid still for being interested. And I remember just throwing the packet in the trash and being like, whatever, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give up on this. But pretty soon after that, I happened to be in the room of a friendly acquaintance of mine. We weren't really close. And she was a non-practicing Catholic. I remember standing in her doorway and she was deeper in her room, I think like putting something in her bag because we were going to walk somewhere together, maybe to class. But what I remember most distinctly was that she had a bookshelf right by her entryway. And one of my favorite hobbies is to look at people's bookshelves and judge them. And so it was great to do at Yale. And so I was checking out the different titles, and there was a book on her shelf called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And I, yeah, I didn't know to make the yummy noises because I wasn't ba uh, raised on Narnia, but the title of the book was really compelling to me. And I'm like, of course I shouldn't just be reading the internet. Of course I should read the book. But I was too embarrassed to ask my friend for the book. I didn't want her to know I was interested. So she wasn't looking anyway, so I just stole the book. Because like, honestly, it's like that big, fits easily into the bag. I had no moral compass, it's not a problem. So I was reading this book uh, over the next couple weeks instead of doing my homework, because that's the responsible thing to do. And there was a day where I had a little bit too much time between classes like for going home. So I was just in the library reading Mere Christianity. And I do not remember what chapter I was in that day, what page or, or anything like that, but I, I do know in the midst of reading it, I was suddenly overwhelmed with knowing that God exists and not, not like a, a Greek God like Zeus or not some generic store brand God or something, but the God who was perfect, the God who made me, who made everything, the God to whom I was going to owe an account. It was like I was at the edges of understanding God's holiness, even though I didn't know that vocabulary word. And the only thing I felt in that moment was fear, because I knew me. I, I was arrogant, I was cruel, I was sexually immoral, I, I lied, I cheated, I was reading a stolen book. Like, it was clear all of the chips were in the guilty category. This wasn't like a question of where do I stand. But really quickly with that fear, I think the Holy Spirit helped me understand that part of the reason Jesus came was to place himself as a barrier between God's wrath and me. He would absorb it. And that the only way to be safe was to run towards him, not away from him. I remember sitting there thinking, I don't want to become a Christian. Christians are really lame. <laughs> but I also thought, well, this is a pretty good deal. Like, I shouldn't turn it down just because it's inconvenient for my life. <laughs> like, I, I should take this deal, you know, shake the hand. I didn't have a pastor or a campus minister with me, but I kind of knew I needed to pray. And so I just shut my eyes, and I was like, okay, fine, I'll become a Christian. And then I went to class. Like, I didn't know what to do with myself, really. <laughs> Uh, later that day, I happened to see outside one of the dining halls a little sign that Yale Students for Christ, which is Yale's um, crew movement, was going to be having a Valentine's party. And I was like, I didn't even know we had a Yale Students for Christ, so I was excited. I was like, I definitely need to go to that party. I remember showing up at that party pretending I was there by accident because I still did not even know how to admit that I was interested in these things. And I showed up, and they were all like, who are you? It's like, oh, I just became a Christian two days ago. It was so ridiculous. And they were like, oh, and so they, they were like, do you want to come to freshman prayer? I was like, sure. Do you want to come to freshman Bible study? Sure. Do you want to come to large group? Yeah. Do you want to go to church? Yes. I stayed there for the next 12 years. I just followed them around like a baby quail, learning all, you know, we hug a lot. Many of us raise our hands. We don't drink too much or swear to make friends. The music's pretty bad, except... That's different now. The music has gotten better. But I was learning all the things you needed to know to sort of be a good evangelical. And it was, it was exciting. And I was really feeling like I started to belong to God's community. But quickly in my Christian life, I recognized, wait a minute, my attraction to women isn't going anywhere. And it's been 19 years, and my attraction to women hasn't gone anywhere. And I found this so agitating. 
And I'd known that the Bible said no to same-sex lust and sexual relationships. And I've since learned Greek and Hebrew, and it still says no. That's fine. I've never had a, a trouble with that part. But what really troubled me early on was I didn't understand why God said no. I couldn't get behind the logic of it. Way before the phrase love is love was a thing, I was like, I don't, doesn't this seem like everything else? I don't get it. And so I would do this little bit of bargaining with God, you know, like, oh, if you'll just explain to me why you ask this, then I will obey you with perfect joy and excellence, which is ridiculous, but sometimes we're ridiculous when we bargain with God. But over time, he kept pressing on me, saying, hey, if you're only willing to obey when you understand and you agree, maybe you're not really worshiping God as God. Maybe you're trying to worship yourself as God. If I was unwilling to obey before I understood, it really put a question mark on who I was actually following. The lesson I needed to learn in those early days, honestly, that I've had to learn a lot in my Christian life is, was I ready to obey before I understood? And that principle can get abused in certain contexts, but when we understand more of who God is, it, it fleshes out in a really beautiful way. So for example, if you were walking down the sidewalk and a stranger ran up to you and asked you to do something risky and dangerous, you'd be like, no, get out. I mean, I hope you'd say no, get out of here, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna do that. But if there was someone in your life who you trusted implicitly, maybe a parent you had a great relationship with or a best friend you'd known for a long time, and they said to you, hey, I can't explain this right now, but I need you to do this thing, and this thing was maybe a little risky or a little dangerous, you'd at least consider doing it based on the understanding of who the person asking was, that you know them, you trust them, that they're for you. I really needed to learn this lesson about God. Was he for me? Could I trust him in who he was? And I got kicked back again and again into the, the story of the garden. I know as a church you're going through Genesis, which I love. Uh, and I, I was confronted over and over again with this picture that God had placed the man and the woman in this beautiful garden and given them a glorious commission to go in all the world and subdue it as his vice regents, cause it to flourish, to be fruitful and multiply. It was just this beautiful, glorious thing. And he'd only given them one prohibition. And it was a very interesting prohibition because it didn't actually make sense very much on its own. It kind of suggests that even before sin entered the world, our salvation was by faith. We could have understood if God's prohibition to them, if he had phrased it in such a way, as like, oh, here, guys, um, here's your one rule. Don't murder each other. Because, you know, we intuitively understand that murder is wrong. If you don't intuitively understand that murder is wrong, that's the kind of situation where you should seek help. We'd be like, yes, right? So if you murdered one another, then you wouldn't be able to be fruitful and multiply. You'd be taking the life of an image bearer. We'd, we'd have all these reasons to say, yes, God, this is a very good prohibition. But the actual prohibition he named was, don't eat the fruit on the tree in the midst of the garden. The day you eat it, you're going to die. That one's a little weird, because even vegans eat fruit. You know what I mean? You're sort of like, what, what's the deal with that one? It feels a little, it feels a little iffy. We, it's harder for us to get to the reasons to it. And this was precisely where the serpent pressed Eve. He got her to use her own data to examine the prohibition. She, she saw that the fruit was attractive, that it would be delicious to eat, that it was desirous to make her wise, so she had all this data here about why it would be good to eat the fruit. And the only thing she had on the other side was God's word saying, if you do this, you're going to die. And I felt like I was in such the same place, like I had all this data why saying yes to my same-sex attraction would be good, would be a, like a positively good thing. And the only thing I had on the other side was God's word saying, if you, if you do this, you're going to die. I, I, was, I was like, oh, Eve was deceived. How in the world am I going to end up making a different decision than she did? Because, you know, she ate, Adam ate, and we all live downstream of that bad decision. And again, I hadn't grown up in church, so I didn't know from Sunday school that the correct answer is always Jesus. I had to learn that for myself in this moment. But it did come back to his character. Is he for me? And the fact that he was willing to die for me 
I understood, wait a minute, he has proven that he's for me. And it, it was even beyond just that he was willing to die for us. It was the fact that he came at all. No one forced him to leave the glories of heaven and take on the human life he took on. And it was a, it was a difficult life of suffering. And he was born into a politically oppressed regime. He lived in a backwater. By the time we see him as a grown-up, uh, his adoptive father is gone. So he probably had to help raise his siblings with his mother Mary. Uh, as, a, as an adult, he wandered around as a homeless man. All of his friends were idiots. And the people who had spent their whole lives training to recognize him actually went on a murder campaign that was successful. I don't know anybody I would do all those things for, let alone a sworn enemy. Yet Jesus, his whole life, including his death, communicated to me, even if I don't understand what he's saying, I know that he's for me. He wouldn't do all of that just to oppress me. He came that we might have life and have it to the full. And so if you don't remember anything else from this morning, I hope you'll just remember the encouragement that God in Christ is for you. Even if there are places in scripture that seem risky or hard, or if you're, there's something that you haven't confessed because it just feels too scary, he is for your good. He has proven that with his life and his death. And we... Um, we can run to him and trust him even with the most vulnerable places of our lives. And if, if that is the farthest I ever got in understanding sexuality, not understanding why he said it, but just knowing that he was good, I think that would have been enough. But I also realized over time, as I was thinking about what the scriptures said, I was trying to enter the scriptures through what God said no to. The no's were what was really bothering me. They seemed arbitrary or cruel. But I had learned that God's character was not arbitrary or cruel. And so I thought, wait a minute, maybe I'm, maybe I'm approaching this from the wrong angle. Maybe there's a way I need to see what God says yes to to help me understand what he says no to. Um, and I have a friend named Sam who told me a story once that illustrates this for me in a way that just delights me. So he has a buddy who, um, who loves to host people, like he loves to have people over. And, and this friend, he had moved into a new apartment, and sometimes you move into an apartment and, and random things get left behind. So he was looking at some of the things that had been left, and he found in the apartment this spoon that seemed like the world's worst spoon. I mean, you know what a spoon looks like. It has the handle, and it's got the little cup part. We well, found a spoon in his apartment that had the handle but instead of having like an actual cup, it was just a rim, so you could like look right through it. So it just had like an edge of a spoon and there was a hole. And so you're like that, you literally can't use that as a spoon, that's super, that's ridiculous. So he was kind of a prankster, so he decided he would put it in his sugar bowl, because he was British, so they have tea. So what he would do is he would invite people over and he would have them fix their own tea and he would watch out of the corner of their eyes, they would open the sugar bowl and discover this terrible spoon that they couldn't actually use. And so they would sort of embarrassedly like try to flick some of the sugar into the bowl. Apparently if there were Americans over, it'd be like, oh, your spoon is so stupid because we're loud. But there was one day apparently where uh, a guy opened up the sugar bowl, he pulled the spoon out and he was like, why do you have an olive spoon in your sugar bowl? And he was like, a what? Now I think olives are disgusting uh, and exhibit A as to why that's true is you know they're sold in those like jars of goo, olive goo. Well, apparently this spoon is amazing if you actually want to fish one of those little guys out and eat it. Because you, you stick it in there, and because it's got a hole that's basically olive size, the olive can sit on it, and all that nasty goo will run off. And then you can eat it, I guess. I would just throw it in the trash. But anyway, you know, it, once you understand what the spoon is for, it helps you look at it and see, well, that's not stupid. It's actually quite, it's actually quite clever. The yes helps you understand <laughs> what its no's are. It's like, well, maybe I need to understand the yes to God's sexuality so it doesn't just look like a, a silly thing to me. And as I was digging into the scriptures uh, with my other friends, it became really clear to me all throughout the Bible, if you want to understand what God says yes to in terms of sexuality, you will continually run into marriage that sexuality and marriage cannot be taken apart in terms of God's yes. 
And we particularly see marriage as this theme from Genesis all the way to Revelation. I mean, the Bible starts and ends with a marriage. It's this powerful, powerful image that God loves to use. And I think scripturally we can understand that there is one job that human marriages are designed to do and that everything that's true about human marriages are so that it can complete this one job it's been given to do. And so the human marriages have one job of displaying God's relationship with his people. They are living, breathing metaphors in every culture of how much God loves his people and what that relationship is like. And so there's a ton of things that are, are packed into the goodness of marriage that help it explain that gospel picture. So we might take one, for example, the good of faithfulness, which is about sexuality and also about more than sexuality, of course. But human marriages are supposed to be faithful forever, well, really until one spouse or the other dies, because God's relationship with his people is forever faithful. We see consistently over scripture, God is the faithful husband. Now God's people, especially in the Old Testament, have a harder track record. We're often more represented as God's unfaithful bride, which is why idolatry and adultery end up becoming keyed terms in the Old Testament. If you want a really depressing quiet time this week, check out Ezekiel 16. But we see in the New Testament, particularly in Ephesians 5, that the work of Christ makes us that unblemished bride. It actually cleans us up so that we are able to be faithful to God just as he is faithful to us. And we could have a little pop quiz here, right? So um, who has trampled on the good of faithfulness more, straight people or gay people? Does anyone have an answer? I hear the whisper of the S. Yeah, straight people, right? Because there's just more of you. There's a, even if God, even if no one had ever been born with same-sex attraction, even if there had never been a gay relationship in the history of the world, um, all of us are good enough at trashing even the good of faithfulness. Every single one of us needs the grace and forgiveness of Christ to actually live up to what God says about our sexuality. Uh, so, We've got this good of faithfulness that's already hard enough for us to live up to. Uh, but there's a second good, too. Uh, you might call this the, the good of building of a household. It, it relates to sexuality, but it also is bigger. right? That um, a human marriage through uh, biological children or adoption or both is supposed to be the beginning of this brand new household because God's relationship with his people is incredibly fruitful and it's the beginning of a brand new family. I love that in the scriptures we're called born again and adopted. Like we are children, we are brothers and sisters together. And so that picture of the family is pointing to the big family that is the most important one, the central one, the one that uh, we most primarily should belong to. We've got faithfulness, household building. But then there's also the good of sexual pleasure. It's not that God looked down upon the earth and was horrified by what he saw us doing with our bodies and was like, oh, I need to legislate this. No, God is the one who invented our bodies. He, he designed them to work the ways that they do. If he wanted the act of reproduction to be boring, he could have made it as dull as like clipping your toenails. But instead, he loaded up the sexual expression with a lot of power. And in human marriage, sexuality is supposed to be a place of intimacy and joy and pleasure because God's relationship with his people is a place of intimacy and joy and pleasure. It is a picture of that. Uh, we see this especially in a place like Song of Solomon, which doesn't mention procreation at all, but is a beautiful picture of married love. And you might read it today and think like, I don't know, your teeth are like a flock of goats is not particularly erotic to Western ears, but it, it, is, a, it is a picture strongly of these things. And even, frankly, if you're single or if you're married but not able to experience sexual expression with your spouse for, for whatever particular reason, this good even points to the fact that sexual desire is not some sort of trick God is playing on us. Um, even the experience of sexual desire that cannot be fulfilled can be looked through to see how much God longs to be with his people and how much we should long to be with him. So it in itself is a powerful, powerful picture of something that's true about the gospel. But one of the difficulties we get to in thinking today about marriage is that a lot of us, through society or through church teaching, 
we're comfortable with those three goods as being definitive of marriage. You know, I'll, uh, I'll marry my best friend, we'll have great sex forever and have kids, or if you don't like kids, you get dogs or something. We're sort of comfortable with that. But then we can hit an awkward point when we we're confronted with the fact of, wait a minute, can't two men do all three of those things? Can't they be faithful to each other, experience sexual pleasure, and adopt? Because we've already said adoption is a valid form of household building. Can't two women do all those things? And we can hit this bump of like, wait a minute, I don't understand why. I think it's because we've lost intuitive touch with this fourth good of sexuality in marriage. It's just as much in scripture, but we don't, we're starting to lose intuitive access to it. Now, each one of us as individuals and as cultures, we're, we're made in God's image. So there are places intuitively where we are in touch with what God is like because we're made in his image. But we're also fallen image bearers, so every person in every society also have places that are wildly out of step with what God says. And I think as a society, we're starting to get out of step with this last one. And that's what we see, that one of the goods of sexuality and marriage is sexual difference, male and female. Not just for the act of procreation, but actually as a deep part of the metaphor. You have these two non-interchangeable parties that are unified, a unity and difference, a love across difference, because it pictures these two non-interchangeable parties, God and his people, who are able to be one through the work of Christ, unified, this love across a much bigger difference. And so it's very much a part of the picture. And we see this over and over again in scripture. The husband or the male is always represented by God and the wife or the female is always represented by the church. And so it's a stable metaphor that's trying to communicate something. And we see this in the Old Testament very clearly in Ephesians 5. It happens all over the place. And sometimes you might think, well, maybe the husband is always representing God because of like um, ancient patriarchy, you know, the, that's just, it's just stuck that God was the man because of patriarchal systems or whatever it is. And it is true that God's preferred pronouns are he, him, his. But he is not afraid to use female language about himself when it communicates something about the gospel because mother's love is also a beautiful picture of the gospel. And so God's not afraid in the prophets to talk about nursing Jacob at his breasts or carrying Israel in his womb. He's not afraid of female language. He uses it when it's, when it's appropriate to tell a story. One of my favorite verses is like, could a mother forget you know, the child at her breast? Yeah, she even might forget, but I'll never forget you. He loves to make this comparison. So the marriage metaphor is not that God's afraid of female language. There's something deeper going on here. And sometimes you might say, well, that's just one type of diversity. Aren't there other types of diversity in human relationships? Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's ethnic differences, cultural difference, personality difference, that's all true. But there's no type of fundamental difference in humanity that matches male and female, that goes all the way down to the cellular level. And when male and female come together in marriage, they are part of this picture of the gospel and God's relationship with his people. This helps us see that we really need all four of those things for a marriage to tell the truth about God's relationship with his people. I think all of us have experienced there are marriages that fit that fourth good, they're male and female, that don't automatically become holy or tell the right story. They might be male and female, but tell really false things about who God is. On the same level, we might know people, uh, women in relationship with other women, men in relationship with other men, who seem to be doing pretty well in various aspects of this good, but yet because they fail on that fourth point, their marriage still falls short of what God has said. It's, it's not actually marriage as he's defined it. it it's not righteous. And so I think part of what that gave me in that study was a recognition of marriage is about the gospel. It's trying to do something. And all of us fall short. All of us need God's grace to be able to do that well because at any of those points, we're naturally going to fail. And it also opened up for me seeing in the New Testament, wait a minute, singleness also gains a brand new dignity. There were whispers of it in the Old Testament but suddenly in the New Testament, you see this vision of the single life burst into view of something that also explains the gospel. And actually, if you read church history, which I'm sure all of you do in your spare time, 
first thousand years, it was so, um, we were like a little too much in the other direction. It was very much like singleness is the varsity team and marriage was JV. Like everyone was really excited about it. Because we, um, to be single for the sake of Christ is able to say, yes, I can affirm the goodness of human marriages, but if I don't participate in those, I'm not missing out on the real thing. I am absolutely guaranteed the real thing. I'm betting my life on the resurrection. The new heavens and the new earth is a place where all of us will be single. As Jesus says in Matthew 22, there's no marriage in heaven. And all of us will be married because we will all be, as we are beginning now, the, br the bride of Christ. Now, if there's any gentlemen out here who are uncomfortable with being the bride of Christ, just remember that we women are also called the sons of God. So it all evens out eventually in those gender terms. And so it gave me this beautiful picture of like, there are, there are two equal and valid vocations for God's people in relation to sexuality, either living in faithful Christian marriage or faithful Christian singleness. And so on some level, it didn't matter who I was attracted to, men or women or both or neither or potted plants, you know, on some level, whatever vocation God was gonna call me to, he would equip me by his spirit to live in that vocation. And so it freed me from the burden of like, needing to change my attractions, instead to just say, whatever they are, he will equip me to walk in faithfulness. Wherever any of us are, he will equip us to walk in faithfulness where he calls us to. And it was so freeing for me. And if we can become church communities where we have healthy marriages and healthy singles thriving together, relating together with grace and truth, what a beautiful picture of the gospel that will be to the watching world, because they tell the story of the gospel in different, beautiful, complementary ways. Now, I, I know not all of you are able to come to the conference this afternoon. I hope many of you will be able to, because we're going to dig into more of this conversation that we were barely able to touch on tonight. Even though the Bible does have a very positive vision of sexuality, for example, we have to recognize that the church hasn't done a very good job of declaring that positive vision. Often we've been the kind of people who just chant no or practice hypocrisy, especially towards um, insiders and outsiders who experience same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria. We haven't lived well into the beautiful vocation God has given to us. There's a, so much space in which we need to confess and repent and do something new but God promises that he loves to do a new thing, that through his scripture and his word and his people, that he wants to transform us into a community of grace and truth, just as Christ came in grace and truth. And so despite our own personal failures or our corporate failures, there is so much goodness to walk forward into. And so I commend you to keep having these conversations, to keep thinking about these things, reading, come back this afternoon, um, keep pursuing this because it's a beautiful avenue to the gospel. So I'm, I'm going to pray for us now and then the band will magically appear behind me. Well, thanks for having me. Father, we thank you that you are not frightened by this cultural moment. You are not scared. You're not confused. You are on the throne, you are in control. We thank you that in Christ, we have been washed clean, that you are not looking at us impatiently or tapping your foot and looking at your watch. You are, you are looking at us with a face full of love despite our failures. I pray that as men and women in this room that we would be able to press ourselves ever deeper into who you are, the fact that you're a good to us and for us. I pray that you would help us take the courageous step of confession and repentance and of saying yes to you and no to temptation. I pray that your spirit would do wonderful things in this body, draw very close to us, uh, do a brand new thing in your power and in your love. We thank you that you've given us this through Christ. And we pray in his name, amen. You know, as we were singing that song, what a powerful name it is, I was struck by the fact that the name of Jesus is so powerful that it could reach 
an atheist girl at Yale, redeem her life and use her to proclaim his name and his truth and his gospel all over the world. And so we want to say thank you once again, Rachel, for sharing his truth with us. Those of you who are maybe going to head out and get lunch and come back, we welcome you back to the conference for Good Design beginning at 1 o'clock here. If you're here this morning and, and you feel like you want someone to pray with you or pray for you, maybe you have questions, you've been moved in some way, members of our prayer team are available for you at the close of the service, right out back there down the hall is the prayer room. We'd love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, may the love of God the Father surround you, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit fill you, and the grace of Jesus Christ attend you now and forever. Amen. And go in his peace.